In just a moment, Magnificent Rogue, the adventures of W.C. Fields on biography and sound. But first... Swing and sway with Sammy Kay. All this week when Sammy and the orchestra play for you in person on NBC Bandstand. The mood is relaxing and mellow. But there's also lots of toe-tapping, hand-clapping rhythm as Art Mooney directs his band in more of their gay minstrel-style hits. Two top bands, plus Dick Hames and Bert Parks, all this week on NBC Bandstand. Now stay tuned for Magnificent Rogue, the adventures of W.C. Fields on NBC. That's fine. Keep it down there. Ladies and gentlemen, down with rum. It is a fairly safe assumption that the speaker didn't have his heart in that right enunciation, as you and I shall see. The National Broadcasting Company presents a repeat performance of Magnificent Rogue. The Adventures of W.C. Fields. The program, one of NBC Radio's award-winning series of biographies in sound, was originally broadcast last February. It is being repeated tonight in answer to many listener requests and as a tribute to the late Fred Allen, who served as narrator. It was the last program Mr. Allen recorded before his death last March. This will be Fred Allen telling of the adventures of W.C. Fields, the famed comedian whose biography we've entitled... Magnificent Rogue. Within the next 55 transcribed minutes, the voices of Ed Wynn, Maurice Chevalier, Max Sennett, Hollywood directors Leo McCary and Norman Torog, and others with stories of a man who all his life regretted that he couldn't make a living out of misdemeanors and small felonies. Juggler, vaudevillian, and one of the screen's greatest comedians, W.C. Fields. Your narrator, Mr. Fred Allen. He was an enigma, a paradox. Sleeping in the fields after I ran away from home, he said, gave me the social outlook of a mole. The mole grew into a giant, and his work on the stage and screen was monumental. But where do you draw the line between Fields the Man and Larson E. Whipsnade, or Egbert Sose, whom he portrayed in his pictures? Incidentally, accent grave over the E in Sose, if you please. He would have wanted it that way. His given name was William Claude Dukenfield and his mother and father called him Claude, a name he disliked so much that he later gave it to some of the villains in his moving pictures, not that he himself was usually cast as a lovable old gentleman. In his pictures, Fields was a charming, unregenerate old reprobate, and the audiences loved him for it. Producer, editor, playwright, William LeBaron. Although it may not be generally realized, we nearly always cast Bill in what, for most actors, would be the villain. It was out of that type of part that he got his big laughs. His charm of personality and method of comedy made the audiences actually love his skullduggery. You know, years ago, when we wanted to plant a character as the villain, we had him smoke a big black cigar and then kick a dog. That immediately indicated to the audience that he was a villain. But when Fields smoked his cigar, which he always did, and was attacked by a small dog, he would administer a swift kick to the animal but the dog instead of Fields became the heavy. Fields got away with this sort of thing as nobody else has ever done. This, of course, was because of a sort of elephant charm the man had, along with tremendous mastery of pantomime and an unerring feel for timing. One of the best examples of how he got great value out of being the reprobate is perhaps the very end of the picture entitled Poppy. He and his daughter had lived their lives in a carnival, and finally in a small town, she had fallen in love with the town boy and had become engaged. On the wedding day, Fields went to the home of the boy where the wedding was being held to see his daughter. 
In a very tender scene, he tells her how he knows that he has not been a good father. But now that she is to marry this fine, upstanding young man, there's one thing he must tell her. One last piece of advice a father should give his daughter. My little poppy, he said, remember this. Never give a sucker an even break. Then he turned and left her. And as he got to the door, he saw a table with a humidor on it. Looking slyly about to see that he was unobserved, he opened the humidor, stole a big handful of cigars, stuck them in his pocket, and walked through the door. And the picture ended. Naturally, it would be ruinous for any other comedian to end a picture on such a note. But with Fields, it was just the sort of thing that worked best. And as I said, the audience loved him for it. But there was a motive behind the sincerity with which he played his villains. Memories of injustices done unto him by barbers and dentists and officers of the law. Through his screen delineations, Fields believed he could settle old scores. Fields was the only authentic humbug of his generation. Author Robert Louis Taylor, biographer of Fields. There's a wide difference between the real blown-in-the-bottle variety and the fake humbug. He had a genuine distaste for the principal horrors of civilization, stuffed shirts, aggressive women, restrictions on drink, noisy children, and middle-class morality, and he fought these brilliantly within the limits of his medium. Each of his movies was a triumph of sin over the Hayes office. The rascal got the girl and the money. Sanctimony wound up in the ash can. In his small but raspy way, he caused hypocrisy just as much grief as he could, and he probably did more to retard the onward march of blue noseism than any other American. When I say that Fields was a fake humbug, I, I mean, actually, that he was, in all sincerity, the man that he portrayed on the screen. The fact is, he insisted, as you may know, on writing his own movies, and he often did them on the backs of envelopes and demanded $25,000 for them so that he could portray himself as just exactly what he was, an outright rascal and scoundrel. Whitey Dukenfield, he called himself Whitey because of his pale blonde hair, was born in Philadelphia in 1879. His father was a London cockney, a peddler of vegetables and fruits, who put the boy to work on his vegetable cart shortly after the lad had passed the diaper stage. Whitey had little schooling. At the age of nine, he sneaked into a vaudeville theater and watched a juggling act, then ran home to practice juggling with his father's oranges and lemons. Peddler Dukenfield disapproved. He was a man who believed in speaking loudly and carrying a big stick. With that stick, at the end of which happened to be a shovel, he began to beat the boy. Whitey left home. In the months to come, Philadelphia police were eager to talk to Whitey about a series of crimes, including shoplifting and robbery. He became familiar with the interiors of the city's jails, and he had jobs in pool rooms, the experience would come in handy later, uh, as an assistant to a man who drove an ice wagon, and as a paper boy. Those who remember his paper deliveries recall that Whitey had the flourish of a grand senior. Somehow, he handed out papers as though he was distributing arms. All this time, however, he continued to practice juggling, and when a Norristown, Pennsylvania amusement park offered him a job, he was ready. For $3.50 a week, he put on a show during which it was difficult to detect whether his mistakes were real or fake, a Fields trademark in later years. He began to make a name for himself, and the New Jersey seashore beckoned. Hollywood director Leo McCary remembers the story. He told me confidentially once that about the first job he ever had was as a sort of a come-on for a pinball concession. It was at a seaside resort. At a time when business was dull, his job was to fall off the pier and be rescued by the lifeguards. They would pull him ashore near the pinball concession. Naturally, a large crowd would gather, and after Fields was revived, many of the people would start playing pinball. He told me he gave the job up after a while because he couldn't see any future in it. Furthermore, he said later, the experience made him bear a grudge against water from those days on. Fields joined the circus as peg boy and drum carrier. Again, Robert Louis Taylor. Circuses provided an, an excellent background for Fields and his manner. He was a kind of con man, <laughs> the lovable con man. <laughs> uh, 
It was first-class entertainment, but I don't think anybody would ever have been taken in by him. But I think the general atmosphere was one of such concentrated deceit and humbug that he felt the competition was a little keen. He removed himself and his particular brand of fraud to fields where he might stand out more sharply. Whitey went to work as a snow shoveler for the city of New York at 20 cents an hour, as juggler in a flea circus on 14th Street, and as a member of Fulton's and Irwin's burlesque shows. His days of poverty and hunger were at an end, but the memories of those days were to haunt him for the rest of his life. Years later, when he had about a million dollars in cash lying idle in various banks, he told his household with a sigh, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. As he lived there in his home in Beverly Hills, he had the continuous feeling that interlopers were about to descend on him. He patrolled the grounds. He even hired a detective to patrol the grounds. Now, it might be possible that he thought they were coming in to rob him because, as a customary thing, he kept around $200,000 in cash on the premises and quite often had it in the pocket of his bathrobe. Fields uh, had a deep distrust of banks because he had lost a small sum in the collapse of a bank during the Depression. So that when he left New York in the musical comedy stage and headed for Hollywood, he had several hundred thousand dollars in small bills on his person in various places. And toward the end of his life, he had deposited in small banks here and there, uh, as many as 50 accounts under various names. In short, Fields felt that, for whatever reason, they were after him all his life. They were trying to catch up with him. The executors of the estate are, I believe, still trying to locate his various bank accounts, some of them even in so far a distant a place as Spain. He would deposit these under outlandish names under the impression that nobody would catch up with him and make away with his funds. He died leaving, I think, $900,000. Not one penny of it drawing interest ever in any place. All of it in checking accounts in small banks. And I don't think all of it has been turned up by any means. But to get back to Fields the Juggler, At the age of 19, he was doing a vaudeville act on the Keith circuit at $125 a week. Although my specialty was juggling, he said later, I used it only as a means to an end. I invented little acts which would seem like episodes out of real life, and I used my juggling to furnish the comedy element. Somehow, even though I was only a kid, I had sense enough to know that I must work my mind and not just my hands. His act had become one of the most popular in all vaudeville, and he began to eat regularly, dining in royal style, letting waiters and chefs feel the sting of his innate pompousness. In 1901, he left for his first European tour. Bill was so great with his kisser, his mugging, you know, and his pantomime. Uncle Jim Hawkins of vaudeville radio and television. He could take the simplest juggling trick and follow it with his face. And uh, if a ball bounced to the floor and supposed to come up his hand, went up into the air and back into his hand, cupped backwards, his, his registering of surprise at this thing, of finding it in his hand, would send the audience into gales. And for that reason, he was the kind of an act that could play the world. He played Germany, France, Belgium, Spain, London. He played South Africa. That was the Greater African Theaters Trust that had uh, Joe Berg and Pretoria and Durban and all those spots. And uh, then he played Ceylon and Colombo and in India. You know, there were a couple of spots there that you stayed five and six weeks in the theater. Just like Australia, we would stay eight and ten weeks in one theater before we'd move on to Melbourne or Brisbane or Adelaide or places like that. And Bill was a dumb act. That is dumb meaning that he didn't talk. In fact, he didn't talk in the act at all, which is why he was such a success in any country that he played, because there was nothing to understand outside of his comedy juggling. No matter which way he turned his head, it would accentuate a simple little trick to such a degree that they would yell. So it didn't matter if it was Hindus or it was Boers or it was anything else. Bill was a big hit. And when he came back to this country, he was in his first follies, Zigfield follies, that he ever uttered a sound. And he was afraid to talk. 
And finally, they just asked him to point up a thing that was happening. Something fell down the stairs. And they said, just say, watch that, you know. And he said, watch that. And he was so astounded at what came out of him that he just stood there and registered this thing. And, of course, his, his mugging on the thing had people and gales. So from that little start, he went into other little bits of conversation. Not too much, but anything he said from then on was very, very funny. The tours gave him more and more confidence. In London, he played for Edward VII. And in Paris, he appeared on the same bill with a young song and dance man. I met uh, W.C. Fields in 1908. Maurice Chevalier. 1908, in Paris, in a big music hall called Folie Berger. Yes. At that time, the Folie Berger were doing a very first-class, big-time variety show, you see. And I was on the bill myself as a star comedian. I was a very young man because I was 20 years old. And on the same bill with me was W.C. Fields. And he was a very, very funny pantomimist. He was uh, doing pantomime all the time and, and, and juggling with, uh, uh, with a billiard. Uh, and, and really a very, very fine act. With him was his brother, a fellow taller than he was, but looking a little bit like him for, for, the, for the face, you know. And we just said hello to each other. He was doing his act, and I was looking from the wings every night and doing my own act after. And we just said hello like that, you see. And a long time after, 20 years after, when I arrived in New York, I saw that uh, W.C. Fields was on a bill. He was playing in a review. But at that time, he had become a talking comedian, and he was a very big star. He was a very big success. So I asked the Paramount people to take me to see his show because I remember him very, very well, you see. And then after the show, we went round to see him. And I said, Mr. Fields, you won't remember, of course, but uh, I was on a bill with you 20 years ago in Paris at the Folie Berger. And he said, yes, yes, don't go on. I remember very well because I have followed your career uh, through the professional papers and I know that you've become uh, what you what you have become now you know and I said well uh, with me it's the same Mr. Fields because I knew that you had become a great talking comedian after having been just a silent act and after that I saw him in Hollywood when I was making pictures with Paramount he came to Paramount too and made pictures and was a terrific success in pictures because he was uh, really one of the greatest uh, uh, comics of all time. He felt lonely on those long tours around the world, lonely even though surrounded by laughing, happy audiences. A man, as Arthur Taylor points out, whose friends were few. He had a few wonderful friends, such as Gene Fowler, John Barrymore and his brother Lionel, John Decker, the artist, and a few of that sort, Guy Kibbe, for example. Those men understood each other and went to such functions as men of that kind might like prize fights and parties where the formalities were dispensed with. Otherwise, I think Fields had no friends at all. His basic fear of people prevented his having a lot of friends. He had a, a real distrust of people, and it would take a period of years, I suggest, before anybody would appear to Fields as a wholly reliable person. One of Fields' principal distrusts was that of the movie industry as a whole. He felt that it was based on a false morality, that the usual Hollywood story of the heroine triumphing over all was false and spurious, and every attempt he made to produce one of his movies of his special kinds was a direct affront to the Hayes office and to the morality that he disliked. In 1900, Fields married a Miss Harriet Hughes of New York City. She and her sister Kitty, a former child actress, accompanied him on a visit to his family in Philadelphia. He told his father of his European tours, how he had called the King Eddie, and how they had gone to pubs together. I remember my brother-in-law very well when he was playing in New York City at the old Keith Union Square Theater. W.C. Fields' sister-in-law, Mrs. George Kuramoto, the former Kitty Hughes. 
We lived very close to the theater, so he and my sister were stopping at our home. I remember sometimes when he stood up with a bottle of ketchup on his head over the dinner table, and our mother was so frightened, she said, Oh, Claude, my goodness, you will certainly drop that right on my good china. And he said, Oh, no, mother, just leave it to me. So we stood around while he waved his hands up and down the table. Finally, he sat down with the bottle still on his head, and the china was in good condition. But if any marriage was ill-fated, it was Fields. There was a difference of religion between them. But more important, Fields couldn't adapt. A son was born to them, W.C. Fields, Jr. Neither father nor son cared to see much of each other. And the stories about them, probably somewhat exaggerated, sprouted. Claude's son came to see him. Errol Flynn. And uh, Claude had at this time always a dark-haired, long-haired, very glamorous secretary. And he used to sun himself in the garden with, of course, a martini in each hand and this dark-haired secretary. And as he sunned himself, uh, there came a knock at the door. The secretary came back and said, your son is here to see you, Mr. Fields. He said, my son, my son? Oh, oh yes, my son. Yes, he said, well, show him in. The son had just become a lawyer. So in came the son with his mother, who Fields obviously had not seen in about 40 years. And as she comes in, he says, well, my boy, I haven't seen you for about 40 years. He said, my goodness, how are you grown? So the son said he'd grown. Claude said, well, he said, uh, now what do you have? He said, uh, martini, martini. The young son lawyer said, no, 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 father, <laughs> I don't drink. He said, out, out, out of my house. A few years after the birth of their son, Mr. and Mrs. Fields separated. He was seldom heard to talk about the marriage as the years went by, going back to his tours of Europe, constantly on the move. He tried desperately to get a speaking part, but the label of comedy juggler wouldn't rub off. I had the feeling, he said, that although I didn't actually have anything right now, I was working to have something soon. I was on a train rushing toward a good place, but I couldn't seem to get there. Later in Hollywood, he used to boast about his travels. I haven't had a drop of water on my tongue since the gold rush days. I was up in Nome, Alaska, and I made the mistake of picking my teeth with an icicle. The icicle melted, and I nearly strangled to death. I crossed the frozen tundra with my trusty dog team, which I ate later. At long last, I arrived at the igloo of an Eskimo friend of mine, who distilled a delectable beverage from whale blubber. I must have been uh, thinking. The next thing I knew, I was struck by a runaway street organ in Allegheny, Pennsylvania. The entrepreneur of this musical cavalcade, an Italian gentleman, was most profuse in his apologies. His poor frightened monkey bit me in the stomach in his excitement. I was rushed to the hospital. Soon after being hospitalized, I took a turn for the nurse, a worse. My nurse, Miss Dorothea Fizzle Daco, was pretty, starched and blonde. Things went along smoothly into one day when my doctor entered my room to find that I had a half Nelson on Miss Fizzle Daco in an effort to rest a vial of rubbing alcohol from her determined grip. He was in Melbourne, Australia, when a cable from a New York producer arrived. Have speaking part for you. Can you come to New York immediately? Fields canceled the rest of his Australian and New Zealand engagements and took the next boat to New York. A few hours after the show opened, the producer dropped Fields' act. Suspicion and distrust ran rampant within him. But the next day, he was signed for the Ziegfeld Follies of 1915. We did have one big argument. One of the stars of the Ziegfeld Follies, Ed Wynn. As a matter of fact, it has been perennially offered in the newspapers as a story that Bill once hit me over the 
head with his pool cue because in a scene which we were doing in the Siegfeld Follies of 1915, someone told him that I was making faces under his pool table while he was doing all these great tricks up there. Well, none of this is true, though Bill and I both allowed it to go on for years, and since his death, of course, I too have... I've never said anything about it. The story is, is a very simple one. Mr. Ziegfeld did not like straight vaudeville acts, which Bill Fields' act really was. So I rewrote his act. As a matter of fact, I wrote a complete new act and then put his vaudeville act in it. And this is the first time that William C. Fields ever spoke on the stage. It is true that I was under the table, but I always was under the table. Now, a strange thing happened. We went to Boston to open our engagement there for four weeks. And on Tuesday morning after our Monday night opening, one of the Boston newspaper critics, in writing about the show, said that the Ed Wynn scene, in which he was ably assisted by William C. Fields, was one of the hilarious scenes of the show. Well, this actually was William C. Fields' scene. It was not my scene. And Bill got very angry and wanted to smash me in the nose that night. I, I didn't know what it was about because I never read criticisms in newspapers until about, well, until after we left the town. Bill Fields was so angry at me because he thought that I actually did something that I had not been doing in the 16 prior weeks to our Boston engagement. Of course, this wasn't true, but I couldn't convince Bill. And he was really angry at me. He never hit me with a pool cue. We allowed that to to remain as a good story to be published once a year about both of us. Flo Ziegfeld didn't like comedians. To him, the main feature of his shows was an army of pretty girls. Fields, on the other hand, considered girls as a backdrop to his act. The two men rarely saw eye to eye, and they constantly argued about money. Nevertheless, Fields stayed in the Follies for seven years. Everyone along Broadway knew Shorty. Mrs. Eddie Dowling, the former Ray Dooley, who worked with him in the Follies. He was quite a character. He was a little bitsy fella. And he worked for Fields for a long time. And any time you heard a lot of noise around the theater, you knew it was Fields and Shorty having an argument. Fields said, uh, Shorty, you know what I'm going to do? He said, you need some teeth. He said, now you haven't any teeth. He said, so for a birthday present, I'm going to buy some nice false teeth. So Mr. Field spent $1,000 on Shorty's teeth. He got beautiful teeth. And he got him a dress suit. And he really, he looked wonderful. Shorty liked the teeth so much that he was always brushing his teeth. And every time Fields went to the sink to wash his hands, Shorty was there brushing his teeth. Every once in a while, Shorty would leave his teeth there. So this night, Fields said, well, I'm going to fool that fellow. Shorty had a very, very big date this night, and he had taken some of Mr. Fields' liquor. And Mr. Fields had, uh, oh, I don't know how many different locks on his trunks, and uh, Shorty had gotten in the trunks. So Fields said, I'll get even with that guy. He said, I'm going to hide his teeth, and I'll put them in his back pocket. So he put them in his back pocket, and Shorty was, oh, so disturbed. He looked all over the place for his teeth, and Mr. Fields said, what are you looking for? He said, oh, I'm not looking for anything, just straightening up the dressing room. Fields called him down about the liquor, and he said, well, Bill, he said, I never touched the liquor. He said, you know I wouldn't do anything like that. Just then, Shorty sat down and let a terrific screech out of him. He had sat on the teeth, so Fields said, well, that takes care of that. I guess you bit yourself. Bill was making about $1,000 a week at this time, in days when income taxes were low. After the Follies, he moved to George White's Scandals, and then accepted the part of Eustace McGoggle in the musical comedy Poppy on Broadway. Poppy opened in 1923, and Fields playing Swindler McGoggle with magnificent ostentation was certainly a sensation. Poppy ran for more than a year, and was later made into a movie. The man who was rushing toward a good place but couldn't seem to get there was the toast of New York. But the zenith of his fame lay still ahead. By 
Biographies in Sound, featuring tonight the story of W.C. Fields, will continue in just a moment. Bill Fields had made his debut in motion pictures in 1925, appearing in D.W. Griffith's silent version of Poppy. But those early pictures shot on Long Island brought in little money. And after appearing in Earl Carroll's Vanities at $6,500 a week, Fields decided to move to Hollywood. He had no family ties, no home. However, Hollywood had heard that Fields' movies were anything but moneymakers, and when the star of the Follies reached California with no contract in hand, he ran into unemployment problems. One day he was playing golf with the discoverer of the Keystone Cops, Max Sennett. During our games, he used to say to me, Mac, I'm having difficulty out here trying to get in the movies, and I'd like to get in your studio. Now, I don't care what you pay me or what you give me. I'd just like to be busy. So the last I said, all right, Bill, come on over. So over he comes. Uh, he said, what do you want me to do? I said, there's only one thing nicely that I want you to do, and that is get on the screen. You're a great artist. Perform. He said, oh, well, he said, now, wait a minute. His whole personality changed, complete change. I could see the adding machine go click, click in his mind. And he said, uh, you know, I get $5,000, of course, when I perform, you know, and up. I said, what do you mean, $5,000 a week? He says, yes, a week. $2,500 when I start and $2,500 in the middle of the week. I said, what's the matter? Are you afraid of fire or something? He says, I'm not taking any chances, my friend. That's my deal. Fields and Senate turned out seven of the brightest comedies for which Hollywood ever claimed credit. Fields became an American institution, and the nation began to imitate his nasal twang. I'll never forget the first day on the picture I did with him. Again, Leo McCary. He didn't show up at all. I was told he was in the front office complaining about his part. I found him in the boss's office with his feet on the desk and a quart, uh, or rather a half a quart to be exact, beside him. Come right in, said Willie. I was talking about you. I was telling the boss here that I'm twice as old as you are and I ought to know twice as much. I just got around to reading your story last night and I came to the conclusion you were trying to kill me in pictures. I thought you and I were good friends, but Caesar thought Brutus was, too. I asked him what he didn't like about the story. He said, I'm coming to that. Last night, I started reading your story in bed, just me and a quart of whiskey. I want you to know that I finished three-fourths of the story and the whole quart of whiskey before I ever got to my part. The censors were beginning to watch Fields with increasing concern, and the publicity boys took advantage of it. Was it true the public wondered that Fields really didn't like children? Maurice Chevalier starts the story. Once I made a picture with a baby, a baby who was 10 months old, called Baby Leroy. <laughs> and that Baby Leroy made such a success in my picture that W.C. Fields wanted the, the little baby to make a picture with him after, you see. <laughs> and Baby Leroy almost stole the picture from W.C. Fields because that Baby Leroy was also terrific. The anecdotes multiplied. Had Fields really diverted the attention of baby Leroy's nurse on the set and supplemented the baby's orange juice with gin? Was it a fact that Leroy went to sleep after drinking the concoction and that Fields could be heard to mumble from his seat in a far corner, walk him around a little, walk him around. The kid's no trooper. Send him home. When I was a child, I heard many stories about Fields. Ronald Leroy Oberacker of the Los Angeles Lifeguard Service the former Baby Leroy, now 23 years old. Some stories I heard were mostly publicity stories. There was a lot of stories about me stealing his gin and him stealing my milk. Another old gag was that he would spike my orange juice. These, more than likely, were a lot of publicity. And my mother has pictures of him holding me. And the expression on the man's face didn't look like the man that would uh, not like children. And Ray Dooley agrees. It was a press story that went around for years and years saying that he didn't like children. In all the scenes that we played, I played his little girl. 
and he was simply wonderful to me. And I had a son. He was five years old when I worked with Mr. Fields. And of course, Mr. Fields was always pushing me around, and I was the naughty little girl, and he was always pretending to strike me. And so my little Jack would never have anything to do with Mr. Fields. When Mr. Fields would come to him and bring him a present, he would look right at him and put his hands behind his back and say, no, no thank you, no, no. And that disturbed Mr. Fields very, very much. He said, Ray, I would give anything in the world, he said, if that little fellow wouldn't make up with me. So I said, well, if someone was pushing your mother around the way you push me around on the stage, do you think you would make up with them? So he said, well, I guess you have something there. But he said, you know that I love children, and it hurts me very, very much. He said, I don't know who started that story. He said, I wish I did. But there were also different versions. Someone once asked him how he liked children. Fried a parboiled, he snarled. And as Robert Louis Taylor points out... Fields was the first to suggest that adults should defend themselves against children. And this, of course, greatly strengthened the race. There should be a statue of him, one hand holding a bottle, the other caning an infant in every public square. They say Fields thought baby Leroy was out to wreck his career. To him, scene stealing was a serious business, and Hollywood and television producer Lester Cowan recalls what action he'd take. I remember when he co-starred with Edgar Bergen. We came to one particular routine in the picture that we had planned for weeks and weeks and weeks. But he took one look at Charlie McCarthy with a little black wig, and we sensed that Charlie was going to steal the scene. Well, we did the scene, but Fields did the scene in such a manner that we had to throw it away. At the end of the picture, they were running neck and neck, and uh, we came to the last scene. It was almost a case of this being the last round, and whoever took that round would take the picture. Uh, Bill brought in a scene that he'd written overnight, and he started to read it to me. So he said, well, Bergen and I enter. Then he goes on and reads pages and pages about things that Fields does. I'll never forget, I turned to him and I said, uh, Bill, uh, where is Bergen during the scene? And he paused and he says, well, uh, he's there all the time. He's there all the time. I just don't notice him. And then there was a ticklish matter of top billing. He'd have no superiors in that department. Well, almost none. Lester Cowan remembers my little chickadee. The contracts were signed, and we had been working on the script for months, but the billing clause had never been agreed upon. Miss West had never previously shared billing with anyone. She was always a star who had her name either alone or at least first. The same had applied to Fields. And I was uh, biding my time and waiting for the right opportunity to try to get this matter settled because it had to be settled. Finally, I brought it up with Miss West, one day in conversation, I said, May, what are we going to do about the billing? She said, Well, uh, you talk to Bill. He's a wonderful gentleman, and uh, I think, as a courtesy to me as a lady, he should let my name come first. Well, I went down to Pasadena where Field was resting. The picture hadn't started yet. And this particular day, he was feeling fairly low. I finally brought up the question of billing, and I says, May says that... Uh, you're a gentleman, and uh, and uh, you ought to let her name come first. And he leaned back with half-closed eyes. He says, says, tell Miss West, he says, they never say Mrs. and Mr. They always say Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. I reported that back to Miss West, and uh, she said, well, I have to try a new tack. And I must say this, that she tried several new tacks, and Miss West finally won. I think she's the only professional person who, to my experience, ever succeeded in outmaneuvering Mr. Fields. If the issue of top billing was important to him, so was the borrowing of jokes. Once more, Leo McCary. One day while I was making this picture with Willie, he came up with a remark that I thought was very funny. He said, Everything I like in life is either illegal, immoral, or fattening. Sometime later, I was making a picture with Irene Dunn and Charles Boyer, and I thought it would be very effective if Irene were to tell the joke to Boyer. We all knew that Willie was full of larceny and couldn't be trusted, so I got him to sign an agreement that he would convey to me all his right title and interest to the joke. The price he asked was quite reasonable, a case of bonded whiskey. 
Then, feeling perfectly safe, I had Miss Dunn speak the line. When the picture came out, it was quite successful. But the critics panned the life out of me for one thing. Why did I steal Alexander Walcott's line, everything I like in life is either illegal, immoral, or fattening? I got very angry, and I called Willie on the phone. I thought you told me that joke was yours, I shouted at him. He said, all I assigned to you was any right title and interest I had in the joke. As it turned out, my rights were nil. So you bought nothing. When you get to be my age, my little chickadee, you'll be much brighter, I hope. Feels like spacious houses, but he never owned one. Instead, he rented places. In Encino, he lived in a house surrounded by seven acres, tennis courts, and a big tile pool. He never used the pool, but played tennis for hours at a time, holding the racket in one hand and a martini in the other, probably serving the olive. But the game in which he uh, excelled was ping pong. Composer and lyricist Anne Ronell, Mrs. Lester Cowan. He was a terrific ping pong artist. And uh, one night after a radio program in Hollywood, I remember that uh, he took us to dinner at Chasen's afterwards. You know, we used to have a table with uh, all his boon companions at Chasen's restaurant. And outside on the terrace was a couple of ping pong tables. So um, uh, Bill uh, allowed me to play ping pong with him that night. I used to stand by, you know, just dying to play with him. didn't think I was good enough. And uh, this particular evening... He was feeling very high indeed and uh, very happy, and he played a terrific game. It was in the fog. I couldn't see a thing. It was so foggy. But he, uh, he, <laughs> he beat everybody around. And then there was golf, which he enjoyed, playing in a rather unorthodox fashion. We always used to call him Claude, a name he detested. Again, Errol Flynn. I remember playing golf with Claude before he got arthritis. And we were out in the golf course, and Claude got furious because he got down in the gully. I heard him smacking this ball around, and so when he came out, I said, Claude, how many was that? I said, I heard you take three. He said, no, I took two. I said, now, wait a minute, Claude. I know very well you took six to get out of there. He said, that was the echo, my boy. In 1940, he leased a big house on a high hill in the center of Hollywood. There in the living room stood a pool table, a ping-pong table, and a small bowling alley. Robert Lewis Taylor went to see him. I went out to his home, which was next door to that of Cecil B. DeMille, but on a slightly lower elevation, which appeared to infuriate him. For reasons obscure to me, he kept watch on DeMille with a high-powered telescope, possibly on the theory that it was a Japanese spy. When I was admitted to the residence by a butler who I later learned was an ex-prize fighter wanted by the police, the great man was playing pool with a 16-year-old blonde he introduced as his secretary. She had learned to type, he said, but was unable to read. He was cheating her at pool and was more than $10 ahead, which she informed me afterward was about $2 more than Fields paid her by the week. I learned later, too, that Fields had gone down the next week to enlist taking along several of his cronies, Gene Fowler, Lionel Barrymore, John Decker, the artist, and other fabulous ruins. The recruiting officer looked them over and inquired in all seriousness, who sent you, the enemy? On his large desk were the house organs of penitentiaries. He was extremely interested in politics. One election day, Gene Fowler saw him on his way down to vote. Who are you going to vote for, Uncle Willie? Fowler asked. I never vote for anybody, Uncle Willie told him. I always vote against. In the middle 30s, Fields became ill. Rather than tell the public the truth, he'd have them think he was drunk. And at a time when his condition grew worse, he was funnier than ever on the screen. Again, Lester Cowan. Whenever he got sick, he would invariably call me and caution me and say, Don't tell anybody. Don't tell the press. The public don't like sick comics. He also felt intuitively that the public understood that uh, man was imperfect, that he made mistakes, and therefore uh, Fields freely admitted and joked about his drinking and other aspects of his unconventional behavior. And his public loved him for it because he never pretended to be anything other than he was. He lay near death after contracting a critical case of pneumonia. 
death he'd call the man in the bright nightgown. And as his friends stood around him, he opened his eyes, smiled, and whispered, O ye of little faith. Shortly thereafter, he recovered. One day I was sitting on my own set. Hollywood director Norman Torog. We were just ready to do the picture with Maurice Chevalier, Bedtime Story, and baby Leroy, who was in diapers and a derby hat, and was about a year and two months old, Bill walked in on the set, had his two-quart cocktail shaker with him, which he always carried in the morning. Well, Bill uh, walked in, looked down at the kid and says, Good morning, baby Leroy. You ready for one? Well, we nearly all fell over. And I said, Bill, I don't think the kid imbibes yet. And he looked at Chevalier with this very innocent face of his and said, Morris, not Maurice, Morris, how about you? Would you just like to taste an olive? Whereby Chevalier got a little ill, deathly pale, at 9 o'clock in the morning and ran for his dressing room. The stories of Bill Fields and the Devil's Brew were countless, and some of the best, of course, came from Fields himself. I would like to offer my favorite recipe to take the place of intoxicants. It's real thirst quencher. It's called the Raspberry Freeze, known in England as the Raspberry Freeze. Take one cup of pineapple juice, two cups of raspberry juice, if you're in Europe, one cup of black tea, three cups of water, and two egg whites. Freeze until half stiff. Well, when you're half stiff, everything is all right. I thank you. He had been a star in vaudeville in Hollywood, and now he was set to try a new medium. Edgar Bergen recalls, I would go up and see Bill at his house, and we would talk about the show. And he was a very gracious host, always good food and uh, good liquor. But when we got on the show, he was just like a fighter in a ring. He, had, he admired anybody who could give him a good fight, and uh, no holes were barred. And we spent most of our times dirtying up the script. That is, writing in or ad-libbing little toppers that the other one wasn't prepared for. <laughs> I tell you what we'll do, Charlie. Let's walk in and surprise Field. Yeah, that's what. Give me my books. <laughs> Hello, Bill. Hiya, Mr. Fields. Fine thing. A man can't even sit in his own boudoir without being accosted by beggars. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, it's your old friends, Edgar and Charlie. Well, yeah. well, so it is. Come in. Yes. Yeah. It's good to see you. Oh, thank you. Well, Charles, I hear you got married and raised yourself a cord of children. <laughs> I, I fear that isn't quite true, sir. You fear it isn't quite true, sir. You fear anything I hate is a polite kid. <laughs> it's good to see you, Bill. Two things improve with age. Old friends and old wine. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> Bill, I was going to bring you a basket of fruit, but I decided to ask you first what you like best and then have it sent out. Oh, I like uh, brandied peaches. Brandy peaches, <laughs> yes. They're very nourishing. Mm -hmm. Squeeze the peaches and yeah. save the juice. <laughs> Bergen, McCarty, and Fields on the subject of birds. You know, I've always been very fond of our feathered friend. Yes. Large, or small, tame, or wild. Blonde or brunette, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bill, you have quite a collection, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yes, I have, Edgar. <laughs> I always have a very rare Australian duck 
Phil Platypus. Uh, how small is this bird? Do you have to have glasses to see it? Yeah, it's about three or four. <laughs> Is it true, Mr. Fields, that when you stood on the corner of Hollywood and Vine, 43 cars waited for your nose to change to green? No. <laughs> now, hey, you woodpecker's lunch. <laughs> you know, Charles, Many's the time I wish you could be here to fill that terrible vacancy. In your heart, Mr. Fields? Oh, in my fireplace. <laughs> he was in his 60s, turning out such classics as You Can't Cheat an Honest Man, My Little Chickadee, Never Give a Sucker an Even Break, and The Bank Dick. But while his earnings soared, so did his drinking. Movie companies began to bar their doors to him. His legs became unsteady, and he frequently stumbled and fell. Again, Robert Louis Taylor. In his last years, Fields was, of course, thoroughly miserable. Uh, he had become sensitized, physically sensitized by his ailments, uh, which did not exclude alcoholism, so that the very touch of sheets against his skin was an excruciating business. It was torture. And uh, he would scream as the sheets were pulled up over him in the various hospitals and sanitariums that he visited. He did not die easy, Fields. I think you might say that he lived and died as Fields, the man that he created for stage and screen. Shortly before midnight on Christmas Eve, 1946, Fields' hospital room was filled with doctors and nurses. The minutes ticked by slowly. Suddenly he opened his eyes, put a finger to his lips and winked. A few minutes later, the man in the bright nightgown called on W.C. Fields. And outside the sanitarium, says Lester Cowan, Some of his friends got some presents, as they were wont to do, and went out to visit Bill at the hospital. As he arrived, Bill was being wheeled out. He had died. One of them told me privately that his first reaction was why the so-and-so, trying to scare us. But there was one time when Bill didn't pull a prank. What manner of man was he, this human paradox? This man who signed his telegrams, Ampico J. Steinway, whose most outrageous actions were performed in impeccably hilarious style, who may have devoted his personal and professional life to getting even with society for a horrible childhood. What motivated this man who listed donations to churches in the Solomon Islands and depreciation on a borrowed lawnmower on his income tax, who was embarrassed when someone told off color jokes in the presence of women? He drank by the court, but he was never drunk. He was fond of flowers, and yet in his pictures at least, advocated theft, arson, and fraud. Perhaps those who knew him and love Bill Fields, have answers to these questions. But for now, it is fitting to give him the last word, the top billing, the final expression of perversity. Until we meet again, this is W.C. Fields saying good night, and I do mean night. You've been listening to another of NBC's transcribed series of Biographies in Sound. Tonight, a repeat performance of Magnificent Rogue, the Adventures of W.C. Fields. The program, originally broadcast last February, was repeated in answer to listener requests and to pay tribute to the late Fred Allen, who served as narrator. The program was written and edited by Joseph Dembo. Excerpts from Mr. Fields' temperance lecture on J. Records. Magnificent Rogue was produced for the NBC Radio Network by NBC News.